morning. I had a dream last night. Well, it's unusual because I never remember my dreams. It's very rare that I remember my dreams. It's even rarer that I remember specifics of them. If I remember anything, usually it's just a type of feeling. It's a type of sensation, not the actual dream itself. And in this dream, I was placed into a grand old house. You can tell that at one point, it had been beautiful and new. Large, large rooms, high ceilings, curved staircases. It was like something out of a, out of a movie. The time had taken its toll. And while you can still tell that the house was firm, that the house was built on a good foundation, that the house was strong, it needed work, it needed care, it needed love in order to work on these values, in order to become what it once was. Something was about to happen in the dream. I never got to find out what it was because Liam walked in the room. <laughs> Many of you may know the quote by Frederick Nietzsche, God is dead. What you may not know and what I did not know until very recently was the rest of that statement. Nietzsche wrote, God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? Now, as a devout atheist, Nietzsche was not talking about the physical death of God. And while I disagree with just about every single thing that ever came from his pen or word that came from his mouth or action that he took, I do have to look at the honesty of his statement here. See, Nietzsche was not talking about, he was not glorying in the fact that God and moral authority were leaving society. Quite the opposite. In fact, he was terrified of the chaos that this world would plunge into once it had finally let go of God and moral authority as he had. The terrifying. As I said, though I disagree with nearly everything a man said or wrote or did, I do have to admit that he was honest in his recognition of what it means for a society and a culture to leave all higher meaning behind as he had. Because darkness and chaos is the result. This past weekend we have seen evil descend upon Charlottesville. In a racist march with literal, not, not, not metaphorical, literal Nazi salutes being given, people walking around with literal quotes by Hitler on their shirts, People giving literal Nazi slogans such as Jews will not replace us and blood and soil. Those are Nazi slogans. Literal. And then we saw the response <clears throat> by counter protesters throwing rocks, bottles filled with concrete. One guy whip whipped up a whole big flamethrower. Not kidding. And then the response to that. Or 
response to the counter protest if someone drove their car into it. What do these things all have to do with each other? A dream. Nietzsche being <coughs> terrified of the chaos that results from God's death. And start. Our world and our culture and our society has been turning and is actively turning against the principles of the Christian faith. This is a demonstrable fact. I could give you a dozen stories from nearly every country on the planet in the last three months that would show this trend. cannot put our heads in the sand and assume that everything is going to be okay. It is time and past time for the church which belongs to Christ to truly awaken and take the actions needed to restore and strengthen our great house so that it will survive the coming darkness. This sounds very negative. It is not my usual upbeat, peppy time. But it's not the time for that. The world is not the same as it was 25 years ago when I was a kid. The world is not the same as it was 20 years ago. The world is not the same 15 years ago as it was 15 years ago or 10 years ago even. And the church, which belongs to Christ, ours included, will not survive if we are content to, to continue on the path of the status quo. Amen. The status quo is not good enough for the church when the world is for the church and when the world looks to the church for direction and guidance. The status quo, the status quo is not good enough for those times. It is certainly not good enough for when all things begin to turn against us. Jesus tells his apostles in Matthew 10, 16 to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He says this to them just as he is sending them out to teach and preach about the kingdom. He says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as do of doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. We will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And so he tells them, be wise. Not just smart, not just quick-witted, but wise as serpents. But in that wisdom, do not bring harm to those that you interact with. This applies to us today. Make no mistake. But we cannot be wise if we are unprepared to deal with the hard issues that surround us. And there are plenty to deal with. Face issues of abortion, radical individualism, radical individualism, sex and sexuality, poverty, orphans, widows, slavery, racial tension, abuse of the weak, worker exploitation, education, materialism, business, business ethics, Christian formation, entertainment, technology, and so much more. There are not a lack of hard and difficult issues for those who follow Christ to deal with wisely. 
But we cannot, we cannot ignore them. Because the Christian walk involves all areas of life. <coughs> there is not an, a section, there is not a kernel, there is not a grain, there is not a thing, a piece of the size of sand in your life that your Christian walk should not inhabit and should not inform. The Christian walk cannot be cut off from any area of life, and these issues cannot be ignored, or else we will find ourselves overcome by what the world says about them, instead of by God. Because you see, assuming that we, assuming that we agree with God without actively chasing that, it's folly. We cannot simply assume that we agree with God if we are not actively pursuing Him. I can't leave my Bible on a shelf and say, you know what? I love Jesus, so I agree with God. If we don't, if we have no clue what God says about something, if we have no clue what God is calling us to, how can we agree with God? It requires us to take an active approach to our faith. Passivity is not an option. Or I suppose it's an option. But it's an option that leads nowhere. In Romans chapter 13. <coughs> Paul starts... This chapter saying, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. He follows that up by encouraged by exhorting the church to love their neighbor. Ending saying, love does no harm to your neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And then he writes in verse, in verse 11, and do this, kind of loving our neighbors, knowing that the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us pass off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We cannot do any of these things with a passive faith. We cannot love our neighbors with a passive faith. We cannot put on the armor of life with a passive faith. We cannot walk with Christ with a passive faith. Mm -hmm. Won't work. The night is far spent in Paul's day. We need to wake up. We must cast off the darkness encroaching on our lives now. Not late. The call is to do so now, not tomorrow, not next week when we feel more comfortable about it. Because the call for the church to be the church is a call for now, not later. If you're walking along the river bank and you see someone drowning in the river, you're not going to sit back and say, oh, I think they'll, I think they'll make it. I'll, I'll just wait. I don't want to bother them right now. I can't do that, are you? I'll, 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 just wait. I'll just make sure that they're drowning. When their hand goes under, then I'll know they're drowning, then I'll go and help them. If your kid falls into the river, you're not going to sit back and say, eh, I'll wait till the hand's under, then I'll get them. You're not going to do that, are you? When their hand goes under, it's too late. We have people 
people who are being sucked under by the world. We cannot wait until their hand disappears to say, oh, I think I guess they need help now. We must be the church now. I must be the church now. Please believe me when I say I'm speaking mostly to myself. But if we're going to follow God, if we're going to be the church, we must first agree with Him about the state of this world. Because this world is not our friend, and it is not a safe haven for us. Our safety and our security is not found in this world. The Bible never speaks of the world around us, the culture around us, the society around us, as our strength, as our comfort, as our foundation. It never speaks of the world like that. And yet so often I find myself at the end of a long, hard day, or a long, hard week, or a long, hard month saying, I just want to do that. <laughs> You see, our only strength and our only provision can be found in Christ. He has given us His Spirit and He has given us His church for strength. <laughs> and if we are running to the things of the world instead of Him, if we are running to the things of this world instead of His church to find our comfort and strength and peace, we're running to the wrong things. I run to the wrong things a lot. Like every week, I find myself running to the, to the wrong things. Not that they're necessarily sinful, but that's not where I should be running to for my strength. Instead, we must flee from the darkness. Not by taking ourselves out of the world, the epistles tell us you can't do that. Right. But by taking ourselves away from the ways of the world. We may not be able to take ourselves out of this world, off this planet completely, but we can take ourselves away from the ways of this world. We can take ourselves away from the things that are, that are pulling us away from Christ. That say, put your faith in me, put your strength in me, come to me for relief. You don't need that. We can't take our way, ourselves away from the ways of the world. But there is much work to do for us to strengthen our self. I won't pat it, I won't make it sound nicer than it is. The time is dark. The time is dark. You pay attention to what is going on in our city, our state, our country, our continent, our world. The time is dark. But this is not a time for fatalism. This is not a time to say, oh well, the time is too dark, the enemy is too big, the world is too strong, I, I can't do anything, so I'm just going to bunker down and never talk to anyone and keep myself safe. We can't do that. It's not a time for fatalism. Nor is it a time for rugged individualism. Where or else may be getting weaker. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'm going to get going where I need to go. And I don't need anyone's help because they're weak anyway. It's not time for that. It's never time for that in church. Rather, it's time to come together as the faithful body of Christ to practice those things which will help us and future generations to be faithful. This is about all of us now and in the future. This week begins
begins a new series of sermons. About how we interact with the world around us, about how we interact with each other, about how we can pull away from the ways of the world. Because in order for us to remain faithful, the church must be the church and all that that entails. It is not good enough for us to say, well, I'm a member of this church. I go there on Sundays. In case you didn't know, it is possible for a preacher to just go to a church on Sundays. There's been a time or two where, I, where it's been a Tuesday and I can't remember what I talked about on Sunday. I had to refresh myself. And I was here talking. <laughs> For us to remain faithful, the church must be the church. And all that that entails. It means coming together and strengthening our communities. It means coming together and strengthening our relationships. It means coming together and recognizing that we are the kingdom of Christ and there are things that we are called to because of that. Things that we are called to do and things that we are called to pull away from. And so I encourage you to be here as we go through these things. How do we look at the world clearly? How do we interact with it in such a way that we preserve and spread the faith? How do we take that great house for my dream, not destroyed, not ravaged by time, but simply needing the love and the care that it needs? How do we give that to the body of Christ? How do we as individuals come together so we are no longer, so that we no longer see ourselves as individuals, but so, so that we see ourselves as the body? That's what, it's, what it's going to take. It's going to require us to give up ourselves, to give up our individual identities, our individual desires and wants. And be the one body that Christ has called us to be. It's what it's going to take. We must do it, lest we be engulfed by the darkness around us. Let us be the light. Let us come together. Let us wake up. Let us truly awaken to rise as the sleeping giant or rather from a sleeping giant, to the unstoppable, unbreakable force that Christ calls us to be. In Matthew 16, he says, upon Peter's confession of him as the Son of God, that this is the foundation, this is the rock that my church will be built on, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that will only remain true if we remain faithful to him. That only remains true if we are true, if we come together and walk in Him. We rise up in the Spirit that He has given us. The time is now for us to wait. Let us wait. Are we staying, Father?